Praise the Sun. Welcome to the Praise the Sun podcast, episode four. This was a very special one uh, with Ryan Cropper, one of my favorite YouTubers. Um, I've been following Ryan's journey for at least seven years now, and he is a master level astral projector. I am very honored uh, that he agreed to have to be on the show. He shares such a great wealth of knowledge. Um, this is actually our first time, re- uh, not first time, this is our second time recording this. Uh, and the first episode is going to be split up into different short clips on YouTube because we had a few uh, technical issues. So we decided, hey, let's do it again. And he agreed to do it again. And I was like, you know, I was like, of course, I'll do it again. Amazing. I can ask different questions. So there are going to be two different versions of this. This is one, this is going to be one long one. And the second one is going to be just short clips that are not part of this podcast. So be sure to hit the YouTube to see the other questions that I got to ask him the first time around that were not being that were not asked this time around. And um, yeah, enjoy the show. Thank you. Life is but a dream. Life is but a dream. Life is but a dream. Yeah. <clears throat> Welcome to the Praise the Sun podcast, where I am honored to have a master level astral projector on this episode, Ryan JC, Ryan James Cropper. You guys are in for an amazing show. Let's get this started. How are you, Ryan? How are you doing? I'm feeling good. Feeling good. Just posted a video on my YouTube channel yesterday, I think, talking about my most recent astral projection attempt. And do I say it was a successful <laughs> period of time in the morning where I bumped into my dog, which was nice because he died some time ago of colon cancer. And so oh, it's wow. good to see him still, you know, walking about in the astral plane. Yeah. Interesting. Um, wow. I wasn't expecting that. So could you talk a little bit about that? Like, do, do when animals pass over, do they also kind of follow the same process as humans where they kind of, well, actually, I don't know what the process is because I don't remember, but I would assume that you do. Um, do they kind of just go into the light or can they, like, why, why, is, why, why, would, why was he still active in the astrals? Yeah, similar process yeah. to people in that once they're out, uh, they're a little disorientated, a little bit confused, and they might even look you know, to match their state of mind, look a little disorientated too. Maybe their eyes will be moving about on their face. Maybe they'll be happy to see you one second and miserable the next or angry the next. Mm -hmm. It it tends to be the same thing for humans and pets. The only thing I haven't seen when it came to an animal uh, passing on is an animal experiencing their life review. I see it when people pass on. But with animals, they tend to just wander their their domain, you know, your house. And in my case, when my dog first died, I saw him going for the food underneath the sink, the kitchen sink. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Wow. Okay. Um, so uh, could you briefly explain what uh, astral projection is in um, any type of simple terms you have? The simplest terms imaginable is imagine being able to die and then you get the chance to come back. It's like a superpower. You get to lie there, slide out of your body, explore the astral plane or the afterlife and the many things that encompass it and come back whenever you like, you know, you experience similar things to the death process and that you can experience your last breath, but essentially it's initiating an out-of-body experience. Another term is an astral projection experience. And some people are kind of born able to do this. Others have to learn, and that can take some time. But I believe that every person can do it. I really do believe that. I've seen complete skeptics change their mind overnight (laughs) because they've been able to leave their body. I've seen very angry, stressed out people that usually find learning things hard and being able to do it after some time. And I've seen some savants out there, some people that are very, very, very good, some little geniuses that are able to do it overnight. And so everyone can do it, but essentially it's you dying, 
And in order for you to slip out of your body, you need to enter into another body called the astral body. Okay. And then you end up once slipping into that vehicle, your astral body, it's essentially an energy body that's layered on top of yours. Once your consciousness shifts into that astral vehicle, you can slide out along with it and then use that to explore the astral realm. You know, there is another form of astral uh, travel per se. It's, it's literally called astral travel. It's when you leave the body as an orb, as to, as to supposed to being inside of an astral vehicle. And that comes with its own host of benefits because as a, a fly on the wall, so to speak, you won't be able to see your hands or your feet. You'll just be floating around. You'll be able to get into the bodies of other living things, you know, possession, uh, although most of the time it's by mistake. <laughs> but you'll also be able to merge your consciousness with other elemental factors like the clouds and the trees, the environment around you, even insects, I'm sure. So there's some differences there. You can go to, well, you can go to a lot of places with astral travel. You can, you can visit these these other planes of existences much more actually than if you were to leave your body with your astral vehicle. You know, most people nowadays they seek out a astral projection experience because when you're in your astral body, everything feels way more vivid, way more real. Matter of fact, it's not uncommon for people to come back to their body and feel like this is the dream because where they just came from seems so much more vibrant, crisp, and, and just filled with, I don't know how else to say it. It's, it's very overwhelming. And so it's, a, it's an incredible sensory experience once you leave your body and it, it can't be mistaken for a dream or a lucid dream, it's just too real to even go near that idea. But essentially, that's what it is. Thank you for that a, a beautiful explanation. Um, could you um, explain to us how you first became uh, interested or aware of the process of astral projection? If I uh, understand correctly, it's also um, connected to your passing over when you were younger? Yeah, so weird thing. I actually used to be able to do this uh, when I was a kid. I just had no idea that I was doing it. I was seeing uh, spirits, you know. We also had a dog back then. I was very small and this particular family dog passed away and I would see it walking through the door of my sister's uh, bedroom. I would also see a very tall man that was so tall you'd have to crouch in order to get underneath our door frame. And I later found out who that was because my mum uh, well, told us who he was after some pushing. At first, she was very reluctant to say, but she just kind of said that he was a guardian. He was a friend of my dad's and he had passed away. Uh, matter of fact, he o she only told us about that because we managed to capture him on camera, you know, literally doing the same thing I would see every night, just crouching underneath our door. And so in the beginning, I thought I was just seeing ghosts. I, I, I mean, heck, still, actually, there are some experiences where I can't tell because I was so, well, everywhere all at once. Back then, a lot of what I was experiencing, a lot of my, my perceptions that I was kind of tuning into became suppressed. As I got into life, I started learning things, you know, going to school, getting caught up in drama. And I remember as I turned 13, I guess puberty hit me there. You know, I was becoming a little bit more frustrated with everything. And I kind of vaguely feel some kind of a spirit guide telling me that, hey, you know, your time's come. You're about to tune out of these gifts because you're focusing too much on what's going on around you. And I just didn't really listen. And then all of a sudden they became suppressed. I, I just, it's like a dream. I just forgot all of that stuff for a while, you know? And then about three years later, I turned 16 and on my 16th birthday, I ended up drowning. 
uh, we go to a local quarry as a dig site that's filled up with water it's blocked off to the public you know you're not supposed to be swimming there it's where they were doing construction and so a lot of the chemicals had spilled over and into all of the water the water was blue for this reason it had a kind of a luring factor to it but it was quite toxic uh, evident by the itching after swimming in it and all the hives that would break out on our bodies but we didn't care we were young and um kind of stupid so <laughs> My friends would throw out cans of beer out into this quarry and they would swim out to fetch it. I, I was very much an introvert back then and I just, I wouldn't talk about what I was going through, my fears, my worries, my concerns. No, no, no I wouldn't tell anyone. So my concerns about swimming, kept I kept them to myself. And so everyone kind of just assumed I was just as good as them as... Well, just as good as them at swimming, but I wasn't. And so when everyone went to chase that can of beer that they threw out into the quarry, I fell behind and then they lost sight of me. And it's funny when you, when you're faced with your mortality, you tend to laugh and kind of, you're, you're quite sarcastic. You don't think it's going to happen to you. It's silly. But then after a while, I kind of got the surprise in my life because that, sarcasm turned into shock like oh crap this is really going to happen i'm really going to um like this is it and then i remember as i'm swimming on top of the surface of the water i'm getting very weak very tired i'm starting to just kind of dip down a little bit and the water's coming up over my mouth and i start taking in some water into my sinus cavity and it, it tastes disgusting as you can imagine all of the all of the chemicals chemicals and all of the the chalk, you know, from where they were digging. As it's coming in and going down my throat, I feel my body run out of oxygen. And because of that, it gets very tight. It starts to cramp up and my body starts to contort in ways that I didn't think were possible. It's very uncomfortable. It's like having someone, a very, very overweight person on top of you, pulling your arms back and twisting it and fingers and yeah it was uh terrifying it felt like someone had a noose on top of all of that around my lungs and they were pulling it so tight that it was gripping cleaving to my heart and just it's a very constricting suffocating experience i'm not even under the water yet after a while i start to sink and let's see if i can remember it was a, some time ago which one of my senses disappeared first? I believe it was my sense of feeling. No, wait, my sense of taste. I couldn't taste the chemicals anymore. That was a cause for concern. And then I couldn't feel the temperature of the water anymore. And then, ooh, as I'm sinking, everything starts to go blank. I remember my smell disappeared along with my taste because they're connected. And then the last thing I remember hearing was my body hitting the quarry. So my, my hearing was the last to go. And then as I'm there, everything goes black and I feel this presence behind me, this being. And it feels like I'm in a, a vast space whilst he's behind me. And he says, you know, if you want, you can leave all this behind. You can leave your life behind because up until that point, my life was quite dysfunctional. And it was kind of like having a, a line drawn in the sand. He's like, if you want, you can take one step forward and you never have to go back to that dysfunction. The pain is gone now. He specifically said, and I, I felt like I could trust him. I said, what about my family? What about my mom? It's not, not fair on them. If I go so soon, he goes, don't worry about them. They're taken care of. They'll learn from the experience and they'll even have to, you know, deal with some of it in their afterlife, but it will be a, a growing experience for them. I didn't like that explanation at all. Um, but a large part of me seriously considered just, you know, taking the chance anyway and crossing over. 
As I pick up my foot and I start to cross over that line, I see an image in the sky, kind of like if your memories were projected onto clouds. And in the memory, I see my dad. He's telling me that I wouldn't be able to amount to anything. And he, he does this thing where he gets his fingers, makes me super hard and he starts poking me into the ground until I'm on the floor. And I just remember seething, just being so mad because I didn't, I didn't believe him, you know, and I wanted to prove him wrong. I thought to myself, you know, while seeing that memory, yeah, I want to come back because I need to prove him wrong. I haven't had a chance yet to prove him wrong. I'm still only 16. I'm just entering into college and yeah, I'd like the chance to prove him otherwise. Another memory showed up soon after that of my girlfriend at the time and I wanted to see her too. She was spending time in the Caribbean and I wanted to see her face. And so those two memories alone were enough for me to come back. It was weird. It was almost like the environment showed me the right memories, you know, the important ones for me to really make a, a solid, logical decision. So I came back. I can't explain how. Uh, a lot of people ask how I came back. I, I just, I wanted to be here. And all of a sudden I came to on the bottom of the quarry. But I couldn't feel my body anymore. I didn't feel the need to breathe at all. And that concerned me greatly because prior to that experience, I watched a horror movie where someone died in water and they were bound to the, the water that they died in. And I thought, oh, great, I'm dead. Just like that horror movie, I'm going to be stuck here for the rest of my eternity. So I kicked off of the floor and I started swimming up. It took a while to get to the surface, but as soon as I hit the surface, everything hit me all at once. My body, my senses, the sound of everything around me, everything turned on. And it was very overwhelming. It took me a while to get to the surface of the cliff face. It was only a small cliff face, but it took forever for me to climb. I then threw up once I got to the top. My friends were concerned. A couple of them wanted me to go to the hospital after I told them that I just drowned. Some of them said, how long were you down there for? It's, it's been forever. And I said, I have no clue. My sense of time completely got away from me. And, you know, they weren't all concerning. Some of them laughed, thought I was making it up. Others could clearly tell that I'd just been through a traumatic experience because my whole body went white. After a while, I just kind of sat there and, and tried to process what happened to me. I was like, oh man, I actually just, I actually just died. I can count myself among a, so many other people out there that have had near-death experiences. And, you know, after all of that kind of excitement, fizzled out. The only thing on my mind was just was seeing my girlfriend. I haven't seen her in a long time, you know? And so I end up going home. I see my girlfriend and, uh, it's, it's sort of, nothing really got better <laughs> after coming back. I found out that she actually cheated on me whilst in the Caribbean and that kind of sucked, but there's still hope for me to prove my dad wrong. And so I went to bed, slept it off, and over the week, you know, during this kind of moving period from high school to college, I started having these weird dreams, dreams that I was mentioning to you earlier about seeing the family dog walk through the door of my sister's bedroom, seeing the tall man crouching underneath the doorway and seeing this weird woman that would just stand right up against my bed. I couldn't see her face. She was too tall. I would just see the buttons on her blouse. She was creepy. I could tell she was old because I could see her, her hands, at least. But I could also feel her envy, her hatred for me. It was very bizarre. And that would happen for at least a month and a half. And I would be so terrified that I would just fall asleep. Blackout out of sheer fear. Some nights I just stayed up all throughout the the night until I could hear my mum making tea downstairs. Then I'd get up and just run, you know. 
I also remembered seeing a troll that would come out of my wall and just point at me until similarly I'd either black out due to fear or stay up all night until I could hear my mum leave her room and start making breakfast for the morning. These memories came up and I couldn't, I mean, at the time all I thought was, okay, I'm seeing dead people. I had a weird past uh, behind me and kind of ahead of me too. Another memory surfaced, some more traumatic memories of my dad, of me waiting for him to come upstairs before I'd fall asleep because I would be terrified of him kicking open the door and abusing either me or my brother. He was a heavy drinker and he was kind of un unpredictable. All of these memories kind of merged with the supernatural memories and they too also got suppressed along with the spiritual gifts, you know, the abilities alongside the abuse and all of the tension within my childhood all went away, locked within my mind. But it seemed that drowning started bringing them up to the surface. And then I remember it was our first day of college. The night before I ended up going to sleep after experiencing a little bit of a panic attack upon remembering these memories. And then the next thing I know is I materialize on the foot of my bed. I'm looking at my hand and it's see-through. I'm, I'm getting this roaring tone going throughout my head and it's horrible. I, I feel like I'm about to go deaf. And then I'm in my body. Well, I'm in my bed. And then I go from being in my bed to the foot of my bed, in my bed, to the foot of my bed, until eventually I'm just there at the foot of my bed, looking at this bright light outside my window. I approach it because it has this allure to it. And as I'm being drawn to this, this white light, like a moth to the flame, I see my mirror on my wall when I see my eyes and they're shrinking to the size of raisins. I'm like, I'm definitely going to go blind after this too, as well as death. I guess I ran out of energy because I end up getting zipped back, pulled away from that light. I turn into somewhat of a light anomaly as I catch my reflection again in the mirror and I get pulled back into my bed. I come to, and based on my limited understanding at the time of astral projection, I just assumed that I teleported. I go to college the next day and I tell my brother he doesn't believe me. I feel like a badass because I've just been watching X-Men. I think X-Men First Class came out or another one of those movies out of the franchise. And I tell my brother, hey, I just teleported and he doesn't believe me. He says, I'm just dreaming. I then go on a quest to find out about abilities. You know, ones that sit well with me. What can the human actually do in the realm of possibility? I start off with the mind because I know the mind can do a lot. I start finding monks that can levitate and do other spectacular feats. And at one point I find a monk that could burn things with his hands. And he momentarily uh, mentioned how he could do some other things in the afterlife because he gets his energy to a certain point, but it didn't quite land. And so I just went back to, you know, trying to teleport. I found a Russian man that was teaching people online. I found his archives, kind of like I was looking at the deep web type of situation. I had to really dig in there to find his footage, but he used to teach teleportation. And so I, I started doing what I thought I was doing. I started learning the ways of teleporting the body, but nothing was happening. After a while, I found that the more memories came up, the more I started having these weird experiences where I would be starting from my bed at the foot of my bed or in another room in the house entirely. It wasn't until I came across a video talking about Professor Xavier on YouTube that I realized what I was doing because his main ability is astral projection. And it looked exactly like what I was going through. 
Sorry to interrupt the podcast. Hope you're doing well and enjoying the show. The last two minutes, uh, Ryan was having a bit of audio issues because of the air conditioner. So if you heard you heard a little bit of uh, muffled sound in the background, it was just his air conditioner. And we had to uh, wait for the air conditioner to turn off and then continue the podcast. So just giving you an explanation. Continue to enjoy the show. Thank you so much. Hit the like, hit the subscribe. Give me a good rating on, on Spotify, please. <laughs> Uh, Professor Xavier was exhibiting the same ability, exhibiting, it's written into his character, he's an expert. And then I found another uh, Marvel superhero that did the same thing, Doctor Strange. So naturally, now I really want to do it. And so I start trying to remember the experiences that I had, because it seemed like the memories that were coming up were putting my body into the same state, which allowed me to leave my body because now I know what was happening. I was leaving my body in my bed and then materializing at the foot of my bed. And so I, at first I just, I kind of let the memories come up the way they usually would. And then I would lean into them a little bit more. I ended up creating a whole system just to allow the memories to come up and to really experience them again. And then, just as expected, I started astral projecting that following night because I had shifted my body into that same state. I thought this was pretty cool because now I was getting there most of the time, although the method was kind of problematic, seeing as it would lead to subtle forms of anxiety, you know? (laughs) So I ended up creating different systems based on what was happening to my mind and just really getting into self-study, you know, what would happen to my body if I remembered this particular memory? What would happen to my body if I left the door open slightly ajar so that I can see outside of my bedroom? Because when my dad, and this is something I, I later found out, when my dad would come upstairs, my attention was fixed on the door and that would keep my awareness outside of my body as I fell asleep, which is one of those common tropes of of astral projection, uh, mind awake, body asleep. And so my upbringing, not only was I able to see spirits, but the dysfunction within my upbringing allowed me to separate out of body. And so I started putting together different methods once I incorporated that aspect of it all as well as the expectation. And over time, I linked to these methods out to the public on a platform as well as documenting, you know, while I was documenting my experiences. It took a while, maybe about four years until I came up with a method that allowed me to astral project all of the time. And that one, really did, uh, really did help because it kept me fixed into an astral projection state, allowing me to leave the body whenever I wanted. At that point, I'd already created courses and I was already known for astral projection. So I feel like I'm getting ahead of the story a little bit. Well, that's the abridged version. I died and brought back memories. I used them in order to reverse engineer what was happening to me. And then I learned how to do it on purpose. It's, it's been a while since then. So uh, <laughs> nice. Fuzzy. Thank you. That was, that yeah. was great. Um, so before we move on for, from that, uh, why do you feel that you had enough breath in your body after hitting the body of the quarry to push yourself up? Do you feel like maybe something from like the other side kind of gave you some type of energy that you needed to move up or mm-hmm. like um why do you feel like you had that ability after having that life review that's it i haven't thought about that actually i i didn't know i had the ability the energy because i couldn't feel my body at all i was purely convinced that i had just died but now that you say it it could have been given to me by the being that was accompanying me during that little life review. Great, thank you for that. I, that's 
I've uh, been watching a lot of uh, near-death experience interviews lately, and that's definitely a question that I've been wanting to ask people because a lot of the times they are like, you know, they're completely inca incapacitated in which they there's no way for them to possibly have the ability to, you know, for instance, like you initiate that experience of pushing yourself out of the quarry and stuff. So uh, thank you for that. For um, best techniques for a beginner who wants to learn how to astro project, could you briefly talk about that? I know you have uh, specifically one technique that you recently uh, wanted to share. Yeah. So what you could do is a few things you can do. I'll give you a little bit extra as well, just for the, the beginner. Just to get aware of an energy outside of the body, you know, or an energy leaving the body. If you take your hand, your physical hand, close your eyes and bring it closely to a wall. You know, as you get it closer to the wall, you'll start to feel like your hand, you know, it should have made contact by now, but it will feel like it's actually going through the wall. That's your astral hand slightly coming out because when you go to put your hand through a wall, you're setting the intention to feel it, to touch it. And what ends up happening is, is because you're moving so slowly, your astral hand tends to slide out a little bit and get ahead of you. Then it puts itself through the physical wall purely out of expectation. It's something that some people can do. There's another thing you can do to get in touch with your astral hand. Um, with this particular exercise, you take your thumb and your pointer finger and you touch it together, then your middle, then your ring, then your pinky, and you go back and forth like this. After a while, you'll notice that you've built rhythm and you'll also notice that you've kind of zoned out a little bit. Once you've noticed those two things, just let your hand naturally stop and you'll find that you'll feel like it's still going. It's like the phantom limb effect. I used to call this aspect of your astral body, the phantom body just so that people could really understand what was happening here. It feels like the phantom limb effect. It's still going. And so what you do is you just take control over that process. You expect to be able to take control over the moving fingers. And then by simply wanting it to stop moving, you'll notice that your fingers will stop moving on a particular finger. And then you're locked in place like this, right? With your phantom hand. And then you can keep the process going simply by wanting it to move. The astral body is very thought responsive. And so it's best not to try to feel this process out, but instead just try to expect it and with will alone, control that process. It's a subtle amount of will. It's not a lot of will, it's very subtle. Astral projection deals with your subtler energy bodies. And so it's good to figure that out in the beginning of it all. Now, other than those two little exercises, putting your hand through a wall, uh, your astral hand or your phantom hand through a wall, as well as feeling your phantom hand moving and then taking control over that process. You can also lie in your bed. And, you know, we all want to move and, and get comfortable. But instead of moving physically, move with your phantom body instead. So if you feel like you need to itch your shoulder, kind of reenact that whole movement with your phantom hand instead. And you never move physically you know, during this process. After about eight irritations, then actually move, try to itch yourself physically. You'll find that you'll most likely slide out of body, at which point you can just, you know, venture out into the astral plane. But those are three little short exercises that should get a beginner in touch with their astral body, you know, and it should help. Great. Um, um, so what about the, uh, the projection aspect of, uh, leaving the body? Um, are there any techniques for beginners in that aspect once they've felt their, their astral body? So the very action of wanting to itch yourself physically will have you project when you oh. finally go to move. It's the same thing. Like maybe, it's, just, it's the same thing for when you're lying there. Let's say you've skipped out on eight irritations. And you've just reenacted them with your phantom body only. So you've acted as if you're doing it. You've reenacted the emotion of itching or moving the head slightly or adjusting your shoulders slightly. 
after the eighth irritation, a lot of people kind of fall asleep a little bit, just a little bit. And then in the moment they feel like they need, to, they need to use the bathroom. So they go to get up only to slide out completely. I find if you're conscious enough to know what you're doing at that point, you're not teeter tottering into states of sleep. You're fully aware of the fact that you intended to astral project. It's good just to get up as if you would in your physical body, because at that point, your awareness has shifted to your astral vehicle. And so the only thing that's going to move is your astral body in the first place, you know? Um, a lot of people wonder, like, should it feel physical to slide out of your body? And I would say yes, because right now you're moving your astral body when you move your physical body. It's just really hard to tell because you're so used to identifying with your physical body. You're so used to seeing it and, and touching it and noticing it. And so you're not fully aware of the other bodies you're moving at the exact same time. But when you start getting a feel for what the astral body feels like as a standalone body, and then you come back to your physical body, you'll be able to become quite aware of how you're moving more than one body at the same time. And so I say that because when you leave the body, yes, it's going to feel physical because really the feeling of physicality is also entwined with the motion of moving your astral body, you know? Thank you for that. Great. Um, so uh, when I get into very deep states of meditation, um, my hands kind of, well, I, I, this is usually how I meditate. Um, I kind of put my hands together and just kind of sit there like that. Um, and after a while, my hands just kind of fuse together. Like I don't feel anything. All the energy is the same. Is that the equivalent to the astral body? Is that something else? Um, cause I just kind of feel like a ball of energy. I just don't, I don't, there's no separate, there's no difference between my hands. They're just kind of fused together. If that makes so sense. So that is chi. That oh, is chi. chi. It's a different form of energy that floats throughout and around your body. And it feels very numbing sometimes, especially if you're stuck in a certain position for a long period of time. Uh, it can also materialize itself by way of heat, uh, static electricity, as well as cold bouts over and throughout the body you know in different forms they're called different things or rather referred to as different things it's all chi but it shifts into different energy states uh, when it's cold it's referred to as prana by the ayurvedics and, and many indian traditions when it's warm by chinese tradition it's called chi when it's electrical in nature most people call it ki or refer to it as ki and so it's chi, not to be confused with your astral body, although it does play a role in activating certain energy centers that lead to a well-developed astral body, which is very important to notice because as you start to do qigong exercises, moving chi up and over the body, over the meridians and the central channel, you'll start to smooth out a lot of the channels that are set in place for the soul to navigate through either to move throughout the channels to enter into your astral vehicle or in terms of astral travel, not astral projection. Remember when the consciousness leaves the body, the consciousness needs to go, the consciousness needs to go into the body, into one of the channels. It's like a tube after which it shoots out the top of the head, out of the crown chakra. And so having some type of energetical practice will help to develop your astral body, especially for long-term practice. Mm -hmm. that actually made quite a lot of sense because in all the ways that I've heard these different um, energies referred to as uh, chi, prana, and ki, especially when I think about ki, because I have I only first heard about ki through Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> and when Goku's powering up, there's electricity going all around him and stuff like that. So that's quite interesting that <laughs> ki is, yeah, will be associated in that way. So... Uh, uh, definitely fascinating. Um, um, is so. Is there any way to uh, kind of add my energy chi to, towards the experience of astral projecting um, through meditation, or is it just best if I'm kind of laying down before bed and kind of focusing that way? Because uh, I can 
I can raise chi quite easily. I've been meditating for a while now, and it's kind of just natural. I kind of get into the breathing state, and I can actually inhale for quite a long time. It really surprises myself, but uh, yeah. So the chi gets you in shape. It's kind of like preparing before an event, but the preparation is separate from the actual event. Usually, there's some resting time in between, you know, to help the body heal uh, before. Let's say Mr. Olympia, when you're showing off your muscles before a race, you know, something like that. It's the same thing for your energy bodies. You tune them up during a separate time so that you're ready, so that you're loaded. And then on the specific day of your experience, you start off from a, a cold space, you know? Not cold in that you're feeling cold, but in that you shouldn't feel like you've got a lot of energy stored in you. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at that point. Because remember, it's subtle. If you go in aggressive, it's going to ruin the, the way in which your energies form and combine together to allow you to have this type of experience. It's very subtle. It's kind of similar to telekinesis. They say you need to be very calm, very relaxed, nothing on your mind. It's the same thing here. Okay, so the energy that you're building up, it's just to lock everything into place. It's just to make sure that everything is clear. There's no blockages and you're good. Naturally, our energy tends to kind of simmer down and, and do as it pleases, and that's fine. You don't need to build it back up before your astral projection attempt. You then lie down. And then the very, the very expectation alone to leave your body can spur along an awakening within certain energy centers. It will give you just the adequate amounts of energy to have you feel into your astral body, you know, to notice that aspect of it all, to have your third eye open up, to have your awareness stay aware whilst your body falls into a deep state of, of rest, you know. Coinciding with some type of technique, starting off at a neutral space or in a neutral space is a good idea. And, and then the technique will do everything for you when it comes to getting your energy right. Thank you for that. Uh, great. What is the uh, visible range frequency of the astral body? Is it the same as with a human body? Because I know our eyes are limited to a certain visible range. Is it different for the astral body? Can you see more colors, um, more dimensions? How does that work? Mm. You're most, you're most likely going to see it if you open your third eye. You know, some people who don't sleep for a long period of time, they start hallucinating slightly. It's like they're crossing over into another world. But the same thing happens, especially if you keep astral projecting. You might find that your hand moves out of your actual hand and you, you, you actually see it because your third eye switches on temporarily to catch that motion. Or you notice that people around you start to shift and behave in weird ways. Uh, physically, maybe you're watching TV and the person next to you is supposed to be watching TV, but at the corner of your third eye, you can see them looking at you and then you look and then they're actually facing the TV. It's because the whole time your third eye was temporarily engaged, seeing them in their astral form, looking at you. Because sometimes the astral body isn't necessarily where it's supposed to be. Sometimes it's looking at other things. Sometimes it's halfway out. And so... When it comes to seeing your energy body, or at least your astral body, usually it's the third eye that has to open first, and that can happen randomly throughout the day, especially if you're practicing astral projection in order for you to see such a body, such a vehicle. Yeah. Fascinating. Thank you for that. Um, can you describe any memorable astral projection experiences that you have? Any, maybe perhaps your favorite experience that you had? Um, I don't have favorites anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they, they all became just as exciting as the next and, and interesting. Yeah. Um, I find what stands out nowadays is the ones that oh, are the ones that kind of don't go as planned, you know, that's what makes them a little different. For example, at one point in time, I was playing with memory regression and I had learned 
how to through psychedelics and tinkering how to uh, put myself into a state of amnesia and I, I got the bright idea one day to forget where I came from before I astral projected so that I had no way to come back I'll just figure it out once I was out right that experience was slightly frustrating because once I left my body I knew I was out of body I knew that was the, the point I knew who I was I just didn't know where my body was, my physical body. So I found myself getting stuck in the astral plane. Yeah. Of course, it was my fault. <laughs> I was stuck in a room for a while, bouncing a ball against the wall. I'd moved all the furniture. I tried opening the doors. Not my room, a completely different room. I couldn't remember where to go. And so I believe that kept me there. It took a while for me to leave. Uh, I didn't do it by myself. Eventually, five other people showed up, just materialized, so that they're from around the world, different backgrounds. And they spoke one word over and over again in their own language. I think it was home now, over and over and over again. And then eventually, whilst they were around me, holding their hands in a circle, I came back to my body and I was like, ah, oh, I was out for way too long, <laughs> you know? Nice. I got very bored. Can you imagine moving furniture? <laughs> you want to rearrange the room? I might as well. It's nothing else to do. You know? <laughs> Dies. <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, so as a beginner, um, as a beginner would uh, hop on YouTube and they're like, okay, I want to learn how to astral project. And sometimes there might be videos that are saying like, don't learn astral projection because of this and that. Are there any potential dangers that people need to know about when learning about this? Um, and if so, how can they mitigate them? You know, there was a time when I would say that the worst thing that could happen to you is just getting drained, right? And don't worry about it. It's just energy. You wake up a little groggy, but then you'll bounce back. But there are a lot of meditations that if you do them alongside astral projection can up the risk factor quite a bit. And so it's best to learn how to astral project and negate dangers before you do these other meditations, because they could make it a little bit more unpleasant for you. For example, I've got some of Joe Dispenza's books over here. He goes heavy into the placebo effect, and I'm a big fan of the placebo effect. And he actually helped me put some uh, final pieces to the puzzle was, was great at the time. I got to a point where I was imagining myself opening my door, then my physical hand would move. My mind body connection was very strong, probably a little too strong, because then I noticed that when I would go to astral project, if I say hit my head on the side of a wall, I would actually feel the pain on my physical body, not a little bit, it felt like I'd actually hit my physical head against the wall. I could feel the actual shape of, of the side of, did I say the wall or the door? The door, I hit my head on the side of the door. And so that was a problem. Uh, there were some other issues. For example, I got attacked by Shannon being in the etheric plane. And as it was biting me, I could feel my physical body moving and, and thrashing about. And I was like, oh, well, now... It's a little bit more dangerous. So, of course, astral projection is fun and by all means embark on an astral journey, but try and do it throughout the earlier day, you know, earlier hours of the day, as to supposed to the night. Because at night time you end up in these etheric planes where these shadow beings are. There are a lot of stories about this, people being in sleep paralysis, and it's best just to be safe. And try not to do any meditations that link your mind to your physical body, otherwise you'll end up in the same predicament that I did. Now, of course, should I say this? I wonder if I should, if I should even say this part, because this could have the opposite effect of a warning. This could actually make you want to do it even more, but use a little bit of common sense. Uh, anything of course, anything that happens to your astral body happens to your physical body. I not only found myself experiencing a little bit of pain here and there, but whenever I try to teleport in the astral plane, my physical body would try to teleport here. My atoms 
would freeze and then try to move away from each other. You, you don't realize how much you're actually moving until you're not moving on an atomic scale. It's very uncomfortable and also slightly painful. <laughs> that happened a few times. Um, on occasion, I also found myself levitating. First time it happened, my shoulder was the only thing on the bed. The rest of my body was up in the air. And that's because I was levitating in the astral plane. Sometimes I like to go over there, levitate and think. You know, just, just, like Dr. Strange, straight out of the comic books. That's where I got the idea from. And then I noticed, yeah, my physical body would be doing the same thing here. Other times I found my arm would be up in the air or it'd be on one side of my body. Other times my legs would just be up in the air. It was very bizarre. On occasion, my whole body would be up in the air and my cover would be draped over the top of me. It'd be very weird. And although this could be a gateway to developing actual superpowers like teleportation and levitation, unless you're very good at avoiding danger, so knowing how to teleport at will away from people or beings, knowing how to astral project during the right times of the day so that you don't get into those types of situations, it's not really uh, suggested to merge your mind with your physical body to experience these feats. Although one day I'm sure I'm going to want to do it anyway, because <laughs> at the moment I can avoid danger pretty quickly, pretty well, actually. I can get away from things before they even figure out what's going on, which is nice. And also throughout all of those experiences, I am actually quite grateful for them because they allow me to discover how to actually protect myself. You see, when you get attacked by shadow beings, your physical, or rather your astral body exhibits abilities. They become the catalyst for you discovering how to defend yourself. At one point, there was a woman, she was a, a ghost. She was yelling at this girl. The girl couldn't see her. She was in 3D. The girl was just you know, yelling at her mom and this ghost had an issue with it. So the ghost came around the bed and started yelling at the girl and, and mocking the girl, mimicking the girl. The girl just kept playing with her doll while she was yelling at her mom. There was me watching this whole thing. The dead girl then looks at me, you know, the ghost, and her head is all, ah, her neck's clearly broken. And um, I don't want her near me. She gets too close, I put my hand out, all of a sudden a door opens up behind her, she gets thrown through the door. In fact, a whole bunch of doors, like an infinity mirror, opens up behind her. She goes through the last one, and then all of a sudden all the doors come back, and slam shut, the door melts into the wall. I've had others where my body lights up and burns things. Now I can develop, or rather, now I can trigger them on purpose, which... It's quite nice because now I'm quite safe over there. But yeah. That was uh, fascinating. Wow. Um, cool. Um, so there's a, you know, a big push around disclosure that's really taking off this year. There's a lot of whistleblowers like the one named David Grush, who uh, supposedly was uh, in Arrow or something like that, who's climbing to... Test, he's testifying in front of Congress saying that, you know, he has evidence that there are people who are working on these UFO retrieval programs. Um, so with that being said, um, have you ever had any type of experiences in the astral or not with beings like maybe perhaps the greys or um, anything like that, that people are kind of aware of in the UFO, ufology kind of space? Um, and are there any good grades? Because, I mean, from what I understand, there kind of is that duality in all species of there's good humans, there's bad humans, there's good, possibly good grades, and there's bad grades. From what I've, you know, researched, at least the good grades that I've heard of are called the Ebens. Um, and that was from uh, one of the per pe personnel named Richard Doty, who was tasked with actually, he was, he was part of the disinformation program. So he was tasked with this this you know this program where he's trying to convince people that you know it's not real there's nothing happening here but apparently it was real but anyways not to you know geek out on my knowledge of ufology but do you have an experience with you know 
ETs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> He's like, which one? <laughs> um, the alien hybrid program was one of my truly first experiences where without a shadow of a doubt, I was like, okay, aliens are real. <laughs> I, uh, let's see if I remember this, it was a while ago, I was also in college. They were attracted to me because I kept leaving my body. And so I guess it's the same for a lot of people out there. If you get into astral projection, you become a beacon of sorts to a lot of things, including gray aliens. I was lying in my bed and as I'm lying there, I feel a little disorientated. And I noticed to my left hand side about three, maybe four tiny little brown aliens this big, almost like they're made out of chocolate. Three of them come up to the side. One of them comes up off the floor in front of me and starts saying, Hey, do you want to be a part of a program, an experiment? And I'm like, okay, this is like everyone's wet dream being taken aboard an alien spaceship. So they never have to come home ever again. This is kind of what I want, but I'm not, I'm not naive, you know? I've also seen horror movies with aliens. And so I say, sure, but first I, I need to know some, um, I need to know some things. How long am I going to be gone for? Are you going to do anything to my physical body? Uh, will I become traumatized? You know, and what are the details of this program? The being starts to become quite dysfunctional. He starts to change his form into more of a well, melted bit of chocolate. His, his eye starts popping and his mouth starts drooping to one side. And I start seeing this shimmer of energy around it. At this point, I'm thinking to myself, ah, he's holding on to this form. This might not even be what he actually looks like. He's just doing this in order to, I guess, seem a little bit more friendly. But I also noticed that it feels like he's trying to hide his thoughts from me. At that point, I got well versed at feeling the thoughts of other beings, as well as pulling the thoughts out of their mind. In the astral plane, a lot of things speak to each other this way. So it's something you tend to pick up, you know, from time to time. And I noticed that he was hiding some things there as I was asking my questions. Then all of a sudden, he invaded my thoughts. And I felt like I was roofied, drugged. It's embarrassing to say this, but I kind of felt like a horny teenager. And um, I felt disgusted by my own thoughts. They're not thoughts I'd usually think, you know? And then he moved to the side and then all of a sudden I see this tall, wow, maybe seven and a half to eight foot white, pure white like albino looking woman walk out of my wall. She had dreads, although they were very thick and, and they seemed to refract light. Uh, she came over to me. Her eyes were slightly wider than usual and they were blue, bluish silver. And then she sat on my lap. She read my mind almost like she had to interface with me first before going ahead with the experiment. And then got put off, got up and walked out the way she came. The feeling disappeared, the, the kind of roofy effect. And I was like, that was embarrassing. And that was also very violating. What the heck? Let's go back to my physical body. And I'm waiting to go back to my physical body and it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. So I get up and I leave my, my door and I, and I go into my brother's room. He's up playing Xbox, always up playing Xbox. I open the door and say, are we awake right now? And he goes, yeah, what's wrong with you? Are you crazy? I go, nah, I no. And so I end up going back to my room, looking through my bed for hair evidence. I'm not sure if I saw something. It was a while ago. 
Maybe I might have found a piece of hair. Maybe not. I think I'm seeing someone at a time, so could have been hers. Hmm. Either way. I know without a shadow of a doubt that wasn't an astral projection experience. I thought it started that way, but it definitely didn't end that way. And um, I think to myself, I should probably tell people, but I probably shouldn't because it's kind of embarrassing. I ended up telling people anyway. And then it became quite a hot topic on YouTube. And I think it's because of two factors. One, it talks about sex. And two, it talks about aliens, alien hybrid. You know, alien hybrid program. I slept on it for a while, but eventually I talked about it. Yeah. Interesting. So, so there was kind of like a, a, a sexual exchange with this being? Like, oh, yeah. Okay. And it kind of felt like it was like an, a, a violation of your kind of free will. Like, you didn't, like, you yep. didn't seem interesting and c could you describe the being again what was it a, a being that looked like a gray or was it a human or no, it, was, it was a human a human it was a human yeah you can laugh it's funny it's kind of hilarious <laughs> a, lot of <laughs> <in the> comments, <laughs> a lot of the people in the comments like you got raped by an alien i'm like i mean they didn't have to do that you know they didn't have to right. kind of roofie me i mean it sounded like a pretty cool experiment right you know especially my age at the time i most likely would have said yes but uh, yeah, it was. A, I think it was an alien hybrid because she had traits of a gray, a tall mm. gray, and she had traits of a person. Yes. And there she was. Yeah. A lot of times um, that I've heard about this story, um, a lot of these channel channelers would be like, "Well, on some level, you agreed on this." Is that? Do you feel that that could be the case for you? <laughs> I think the only thing that might have led to this when it comes to me agreeing to this type of experience was my natural fascination of aliens, you know? I mean, everyone wonders, and it's hard not to look into things like astral projection without coming across a few alien videos from time to time. You know? but I didn't believe that I would bump into one. I was actually quite skeptical in the very beginning of all of this. But then as I started bumping into gnomes, fairies, dragons, what I would encounter would escalate. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess this is real. Then I guess this is real. And this is real. Yeah. And, you know, I, I often say that if it's out there somewhere, whether it be in a textbook or a YouTube video, it most likely exists. There are ways to find out. Leaving the body is one of them, especially when you can travel the world in an astral state. You can see things like Yeli, Bigfoot, uh, Dogman, and stuff like that, and cryptids. You can find them. There are other stories about other cryptids that if you just think about them, it suggests that they will follow you and find you. I guess astral projection is one way to attract such attention, especially when it comes to aliens. And, you know, ex experiments, experiences even didn't stop after that. I've kind of cataloged them on my YouTube channel. They tend to just kind of show up, you get different types of species showing up to you. And a lot of them seem to have this dimensional quality to them where they can face through a wall, either show up in the astral plane or this reality or seemingly traverse both of them. It's very weird. They're very weird. And a lot of the, the videos nowadays are reflecting this. You know, you're hearing stories of aliens leaving a ship. I heard about this the other day. Aliens left a ship that was attacked by the government and they formed together as one giant orb. And then all of a sudden, kind of like shot out energy towards the people that were attacking her or them and then they all turned into stone and so yeah it's it's bizarre how they behave i was trying i don't know if that's gonna be distracting oh i don't i don't hear anything um 
Um, but yeah, thank you for that. That's, that's really fascinating. Have you ever seen any evidence of a secret government program, secret space program or anything? I hear a lot about bases on the moon and perhaps Mars and or, you know, uh, underwater. Have you seen any ever any type of evidence during your journeys? A couple, a couple of them. I saw a base on the moon, if I remember correctly. They had a kind of safe there where they kept certain objects, but I couldn't enter it because they had shielded it from people who were astral projecting and similar beings alike. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah, I think I actually quite um, remember that story on uh, on YouTube. Uh, it's definitely one of my favorite ones uh, because um, it kind of shows that uh, you know there are there are factions of organizations that are aware of the abilities that people have and how to protect on that level to keep people away from them and stuff like that, and that they can even see that see your astral body as well. So that's that's. Uh, fascinating as well um have you ever seen any underwater facilities uh, anything like that no uh, i've tried going underwater but i freaked out a little bit like, it's very dark <laughs> it does <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah uh yeah i mean there's all kinds of theories about different species of beings that we have never even seen that could exist under our water and that's always kind of spooky to me, but uh, uh, that's interesting. Um, uh, what about uh, Inner Earth? Any seen any? I hear about like civilizations in Inner Earth. Have you ever seen any evidence of that? Any Inner Earth civilizations? Yeah. Okay. On a particular experience, um, I fell through the floor, kind of like the TikTok videos. You know, when they move it to the side and they fall and they show up in another country, but I showed up free falling throughout the sky. As I'm falling, I notice I, I intentionally did this to find the center of the earth. So as I'm free falling, I notice my environment. And I start to catalog the environment so that I can come back and make a video on it. You know, it looked very much like the Dragon Ball Z terrain of things, the giant rocks with the patches of grass on top, you know, the, the mountains, only they were bigger and much wider. And as I'm falling, I notice, uh, these marks within the side of a cliff face that look like that it looks like a machine had flown out and scraped the cliff on the way out. And these cliffs were massive. So these the lesions of sorts were pretty large. So I'm, I'm not sure this to the scale at which the machine was, but it had to have been colossal. I would say that the kind of lines ingrained into the rock itself were, were at least four miles wide each and there was at least two of them these are these markings that went up the rock face you know all the way from the bottom to the top and so as i'm falling i notice that i'm like okay that could have been some type of tech or a ship the terrain looks jungle and i see a pyramid in the middle of like nowhere and as i fall down I, I catch myself in the air and i land on f on the top of this pyramid because there's a little balcony there and by the way on the way down i noticed that the pyramid was structured in a very strange way it was kind of separated into three parts by three models of cats unlike i've ever seen before i i, I have no clue as to the species of cat it kind of reminded me of wakanda for a moment there meets uh king kong a little bit and so these cats they're built out of the rock and they separate these sections of the pyramids and i, I land on top of this pyramid and i find myself walking into this kind of balcony-esque type area where there seems to be a compartment about five and a half feet tall to about three feet wide almost like a dumb waiter just very long in diameter and this compartment is is lined with metal that has holes in it okay so as i'm standing in this compartment now i can see inside the top of the pyramid and it feels very roomy 
it feels like someone's there, but I couldn't see them. And then I came back to my body because I had run empty. I had been astral projecting all day that day. And so it was very uh, hard, let's say, to remain conscious. And that's just something that generally happens. You know, you're on a time limit of sorts. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Wow. Wow. And you, uh, so you didn't see any uh, beings or anything down there? Not yet. I'm sure I'll go again at some point and I'll go there straight away so that I can explore some more. Maybe I'll forget a little bit as to where I came from. So I'm there longer. I know those though. Nowadays, I don't really have to resort to those methods. I can just go. I'll probably look for the coastal region, you know, maybe there'll be something there, or perhaps I'll look for a city instead. Interesting. That makes me think, do you, I mean, obviously you don't know, but do you think this possibly could have been a possible remnant from a lost civilization, perhaps Atlantis that might have sank? Um, or um, I'm not sure. But I haven't thought about that. It could be, except it seemed very much livable and, you know, I wouldn't say modern. It did look ancient, but it, was look, it looked like it was still being used. Hmm. Interesting. Um, have you ever been to uh, Antarctica and seen anything there? No, no. Part okay. of me is kind of concerned. I hear a lot of stories about Antarctica. And based on how my body's set up at the moment, the last thing I want is to teleport <laughs> over there. <laughs> yeah. Um, the most famous uh, interaction that uh, most people have heard about who are interested is that um, the astronaut Buzz Aldrin was invited to go to Antarctica. And he said that I've seen the, we've seen the face of evil and then he said something else I can't remember, but that's not a, <laughs> that is not reassuring at, at any, uh, any, any rate, you know, that's doesn't, and, and then I, but then I think he had a heart attack after that. So I'm <laughs> just oh, like, what did he geez. see? Yeah. Like, what did you see down there? That's. Did you hear about the Nephilim, the stories about the Nephilim existing under the ice in bunkers? With with the government creating things, <laughs> technology. Is this the is this the version where the Nephilim are in stasis and they're sleeping, or is this something? No, else? no, they're awake. Oh, I think this is recent. I only heard about it like a month ago. Someone came forward saying how there were giants that were would refer to themselves as Nephilim, and that they said that they were getting ready for a battle with God, and that He's going to return <laughs> one day, and that they're very confident that they're going to win. And if you look at the New Testament. Uh, God sounds like an alien, and if you replace just five words in a certain way, it starts to describe or at least paint a picture of ancient aliens coming over to Jerusalem and saying, hey, I'm, I made you type of situation, and our name is in your DNA type of situation, and there's one God, and he, I mean, he says he's one God. In, in the Bible, or at least he's referred to as being only one. But then if you look at it in certain ways, some things that he says, you know, like sitting on, on the council of the gods, plural gods, multiple gods, like there's a council, you need more than one god for a council, right? And so like, there's this guy, I think his name is called Paul Willis on YouTube. He breaks it down really well. He goes through the Bible completely and mentions all these different facets of the Bible where God is being described in a way that doesn't sound godly. It actually sounds like he's a general of an alien fleet, a general that likes the smell of burning fats and likes virgins, you know, uh, has some interesting qualities that can be likened to other deities and even reptilians that are walking around nowadays or presumably walking around nowadays, you know? And then you look at the New Testament, you look at the, the God that Jesus speaks of and it sounds, it sounds like a completely different God. It sounds more kind, more loving, 
gives you what you need when you need very forgiving whereas the the god in uh, the book of moses and other books that came before jesus speaks of god as if he's this being that came out from the heavens the stars and was actually quite cruel to the people uh, that he was in charge of you know when they were hungry he would give them I think it was a stone to eat, something ridiculous that just portrayed his character. Yeah. But don't just take my word for it. Look it up. Look, look into it. This guy, I think his name is Paul Wallace on YouTube. You can look at, is Yeshua an alien? Was Jesus an alien? He has a whole bunch of videos. And he's, he's not someone who takes ideas and runs with them. Like he's very factual. It's in his line of work to be this factual, except he also entertains the ancient alien hypothesis. Whereas most scientists and what are they called? Those who break down texts and translate books would be against such notions of aliens having visited us within our past there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. I mean, I'm, I, I love this type of stuff, so I'm definitely going to be doing some uh, research on that for sure. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. um I had a, a question just now about that. Um, let's, I, I wrote a question down just now when you were talking about, um, uh, reptilians have you ever seen any shape-shifting aspects of people while traveling or maybe even not but you've seen something i was like something's weird <laughs> with this person there's something off here um have you ever seen anything of that nature not into reptiles into other things yeah it seems to be something a lot of things do over there they can never quite get the eyes right though you always move around in weird directions. But uh, reptilians, I haven't seen a shape-shifting reptilian in the astral plane. You know, when it comes, to, well, as it stands, as seeing a person shift into it. I've seen a reptilian, though, a long time ago. It's one of the memories that surfaced um, during an astral projection experience. Well, at least I think it was an astral projection experience. Could have well been, could have very well been a real experience. Where I was taken on board of a ship as a kid and again as an adult later and i was asked a series of questions about the state of the earth and the people on it in front of different beings and one of them was definitely a reptilian <laughs> yeah but they were asking questions in regard to how we think how we treat each other do we care about the earth stuff like that mm-hmm Interesting. Fascinating. Uh, I remember the, the question now is about the Nephilim. Um, so the Nephilim have a, so, so to speak, quote unquote, bone to pick with whatever God that they're preparing to fight. But do they have any issues with humans? Do we want to take over or what's, do you know anything about that? Only what I've heard online, you know, stories of giants killing people that are camping. Um, I mean, if they're working with people as well, I guess they don't all hate humans. The story is, is that Nephilims are fallen angels. So basically parts of the, the fleet of the Elohim, Elohim that were exiled and cast down to earth. Matter of fact, they say that when you see certain stars, they're either Elohim or other entities that are falling into our atmosphere that you shouldn't pray to these falling stars because you're praying to an angel, a fallen angel. That in other texts as well, they say, listen to our prayers and either use that as an opportunity to influence us. You know, like, oh, we're hearing voices. This must be God. But then they steer us down a path of evil. Or they will use it as an opportunity to be worshipped. You know, worshipping a fallen angel. And so they're the Elo Elohim <clears throat> that, or sorry, I should say they are the offspring of the Elohim because <laughs> Nephilim, the, Elo the Elohim 
had children with people on the earth at the time and then created the Elohim, the giants. There we go. Then they're the ones that are currently uh, supposedly underground creating this technology to battle God once the Elohim come back to, I guess, check on their experiment. Interesting. So what the the God, so to speak, be the Anunnaki? Aren't they the offspring? Are the Elohim the offspring of the Anunnaki since the story is that the Anunnaki integrated their DNA with the human DNA? Would that be accurate? They yeah, so different it. cultures have different names for the Elohim. One of the names is literally Anunnaki. Mm. And so I think there's about four or five different names uh, that different cultures around the world at the same time gave these sky people. So of course, you've got aliens coming out, <laughs> you know, descending from the sky. A lot of people are going to see them and give them different names. They're right. the same. Interesting. Um, have you ever had any encounters with any being claiming to be an Anunnaki or Elohim? Or? Not in a direct sense in that they haven't explicitly stated that they're Elohim or Nephilim, but I have had experiences with giants that were buried under mounds and their astral bodies are still intact. They lived there as a form of consciousness in Scotland and they showed me where they were buried. They came out of the mounds as sacred geometry, uh, energy beings. And so, yeah, you can definitely, and you know, that actually lines up with the story in the Bible. Who was it? Someone was sleeping on a mountain, not a mountain, not the Bible. Sorry, I'm getting the, the, the thought. Myth, it's not even mythology. I'm getting everything mixed up. There are stories of people sleeping on top of mounds. I think this might be Celtic tradition. And if you do so, you can actually converse with the beings that are resting underneath the mounds. Okay, the mounds of dirt. And in the Bible, I believe one individual was caught sleeping on a rock. And that's what ended up initiating his line of contact. Now, some people believe it was the rock itself. It was some type of ancient technology. Others believe that the rock was simply put there to uh, portray a burial site, that there was a giant buried underneath there or some type of being that was able to speak to him and converse with him in the astral plane. So there are stories across different cultures about what to do to speak to these beings, you know, uh, from a physical standpoint, just going to sleep. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, there is definitely a story that I've heard about a, there was a, I think there was the U S Marines who had ended up do, in, in, engaging in some type of battle with a, a, a red haired giant. Um, and, uh, some of them actually lived to tell the story, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was a giant. They did battle. He had a spear, uh, he killed some of them, but, um, one of them lived to tell the story. The, uh, the YouTuber, Mr. Ballin did a, a video about it. And, uh, yeah, it was a really fascinating story since the people live to talk about it. You know, you don't hear about people in modern day doing battle with a giant and living to talk about it. But yeah, that definitely was interesting. I think it was in Afghanistan or something like that. Um, somewhere, somewhere in that area. So I think so. Yeah. Yeah. The giants. Giant theory is real. Okay. Um, so um, back to astral projecting. Um, have you ever encountered beings who are like enforcer of the time stream? They're kind of like making sure the time is not being manipulated or um, are there any like sacred timelines that must be protected and, you know, kind of on a Loki aspect of things? <laughs> I've come close to something similar to that in that at one point I astral projected and there was a whole bunch of me's astral projecting seemingly all at, the all at the same time. And they were cracking in and out of time and space and it was making this space very dysfunctional. And this being showed up and said that I needed to go because I was ruining things. I was breaking uh, the space. And so that felt similar to what you just mentioned, but that would be pretty much it. Yeah, we came to some type of dysfunction over there. Okay, fascinating. Thank you for that. Um, uh, so you might, uh, I don't know if you have knowledge about this or not, but it's one of the new questions that I, I wanted to ask. 
Um, so how does cellular memory work from lifetime to lifetime? Why do people incarnate with certain Ill illnesses like chronic headaches because they've been decapitated or something like that? Like, how does that cellular memory work? Because wouldn't once you pass over and you go back to the you know source of universal mind, God, whatever, wouldn't all of those aspects of you be healed? Why is it that certain people seem to come back with these kind of illnesses that are related to past lives, past lives, if you will. Hmm, it's interesting. Well, I know that when you pass on, you don't have to completely go all the way, you know, all the way back to source before then reincarnating. Sometimes you can, you can kind of cut that journey short and then come back. I can theorize that perhaps because you haven't been completely reset that your memory is still intact of the events that happened before you died and so you're coming into a body loaded with information and then the body could exhibit a lot of that information you know it's kind of like a kind of spiritual placebo effect and that if you believe that you have an issue then it's going to manifest in your body or on your body but you actually know you have an issue. Well, at least you had an issue within your last body. You were decapitated. You know, maybe you burnt yourself or someone got you with a arrowhead. That feeling, that energy of this part of my body is damaged could very well cross over to a baby, you know, a baby body. Having the body exhibit certain attributes, whether it be pain, a birthmark, or let's say a scar, but I'm just theorizing here. I, I, I really wouldn't know because I haven't looked into it in the astral plane. And it's not something I've come across on psychedelics neither, but it's something that I've, I've heard of. So, uh, yeah, I guess it's as good as yours. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I hear time and time again that, you know, uh, all things are happening now, past, present, and future. And if that is the case, how how do we experience time in a fashion where there's a past life and there's a future if everything's kind of simultaneously happening now? Uh, from my understanding, it's just your perspective on where you're focusing your your awareness on the visible spectrum of things since everything's happening now. But I don't know. I'm just asking you, is it? How does that work? Can you rephrase the question? Okay, yeah. So okay. if everything is happening now and, you mm -hmm. know, people people have past life re regressions and people have things that happen in a past life, but time oh. is simultaneously happening now, how do how does that work? Um, right. how, do, how are we experiencing things all simultaneously now, but we can have a, so to speak, past life? It's context. People have a certain context that they kind of lean on when they go into past life regressions. It disappears very quickly when you start to shift into past selves uh, and you start to realize that, oh, wait a minute, there is a moment in this meditation where I realize that I am actually still alive as my past self and that I'm also still alive as my future self or alternate versions of myself. And really, it's just a matter of perception that locks me into this frame of reference, this point in time and space. It's bizarre sensing that shift in awareness or that change in perception. It, it, it always happens when you traverse space and you, and you become that past self, whether that be through a hypnosis session through astral projection or on a psychedelic like ayahuasca, plant medicine. But it's really just perceptions. The more you start to bounce around into different realities, the more you realize how much your perception really does ground you here. And it also determines as to what you experience by quite an extent. You could even learn how to turn a lot of those things off, you know, through choosing not to believe in them or choosing not to be indoctrinated into them in the first place. Just choose to forget what you know about the world and certain aspects of the world. And you'll find that you'll start to become very ungrounded to this reality. Uh, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. So, we'll sure. have, 
Have you ever heard of um, uh, a psychonaut called uh, Kalindi E? Mm -mm. So uh, he's uh, he passed away, I think, in 2020. But he was a uh, African American male. Uh, I believe he was like in his 50s or so, and he would take really high doses of psilocybin. I'm talking like 50, 60 grams of psilocybin. And uh, he talked, he gave a lot of seminars that were really fascinating. But he talked about on really high doses of psilocybin. Uh, well, first off, you're not there anymore. You're in a completely, you're in a completely different <laughs> dimension. Um, and he said, uh, he talked about how certain things like carpets in his house would turn into portals into different dimensions. And he said that there was like this Buddhist uh, carpet, carpet, I believe that he had, and he like went into the carpet and there were like beings inside of the carpet that were like spiritual beings in that, in that dimension. And it was just really interesting. And he talked about, he was also a, 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 a martial artist and he talked about doing battle with Jinn and Mantis beings. One of my favorite stories is that he said that he, uh, he ran into these Jinn beings and uh, I don't remember how he got into this this thing. I don't know if they like they offered him something or something like that. But he got put inside of this trap, and every time he opened the door to leave, the room shrank. And so he was like, walk through the door, and the room would shrink again and shrink again and shrink again. And he said that he had to like shrink himself t to like a very small size on a molecular level to like take himself out of the trap and he said once he got out the gin were like dying of laughter or something like that so um so he has some really fascinating stories but um have you ever heard of anything like with carpets being portals or um other objects being possible portals into different locations dimensions oh yeah uh that was a great story <laughs> yeah so, uh, you made me want to take psychedelics again <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, man. Fifty grams is a lot, man. It's it is. It's a lot. It's I don't know, but it made me want to do it. But I don't know, man. I I I, I occasionally take a uh, penis envy, which is like one of the highest concentrations of uh, psilocin, and uh, even just three five grams be a lot for me. So I I don't know, like psilocin different from psilocybin or uh, so psilocin is the active compound once it hits your stomach and it gets digested so you take oh, psilocybin okay. and psilocin is when it hits your stomach it hits your digestive tract and it changes the chemical compound uh so it has the highest concentration of of uh psilocin which is, means it's actively available already in a high concentration wow. um so yeah, yeah that that strain is called penis envy uh, i forgot the history behind it but um but yeah um, yeah, I, I can definitely, you know, after this, send you a, one of my favorite uh, speeches that he gave and talk about these these things because you might find it fascinating. But uh, yeah, could you speak on uh, any type of portals yeah. being carpets or anything like that? On mushrooms, um, I haven't, I've only had a few handful of experiences with mushrooms and they didn't get to that extent, but LSD. Yeah. Uh, San Pedro and other substances have revealed similar portals, although different. You know, wood grain, the knots and the lines inside of wood. Well, there's this time where there was this time when we were in Costa Rica and Airbnb. And it was like the floor was the ceiling. They had taken slabs of wood and they put them on the ceiling. And we decided to microdose on LSD. But before we microdosed, I took a tab. First time taking LSD. <laughs> and uh, as I'm looking at the ceiling, I noticed that I start to see all these faces. I think they call it pareidolia. You see them off psychedelics too. Only this time they're very obvious because I've just taken a tab. And they start talking amongst each other and looking at me and, and they're moving, like they're animated. I think to myself, this is bizarre. Um, I see, I can see you. And they all look at me like this. 
like terrified all at once. And the energy coming from that ceiling was so overbearing. I was like, well, I'm done with this. And I got up and I left and I sat down uh, in front of the couch, sitting in front of a table. I opened up my laptop and off to the side of the laptop, there's a dresser. Similarly to the ceiling that I just walked away from, it had lines and, and knots in the wood and it starts moving like a radio signal. And then I get in touch with these aliens and they say, we were in touch with your ancestors, they said to me. And uh, I said, why can't I see aliens in the sky? And they said, well, because one of your ancestors saw us and they didn't want to see us anymore. They were, he was so afraid that we disabled the ability in his DNA to see us in the sky. And that carried through to your generation. And now you and your family can't see aliens in the sky. Of course, separate from astral projection, I'm not in the body anymore. But I thought that's interesting. Can, can you turn it back on in my in my being? Can you reactivate that very ability to see you in the sky? And they said, Yeah, sure. Some weird things happened. <laughs> I felt very strange. And I said, Okay, now it's done. I then got up after speaking to them. I laid back on the bed and now I'm facing the ceiling again. And the faces have calmed down a little bit. I take my attention to one that I was having a conversation with earlier before they all became quite active. And I ask it about the veil. What is the veil? Am I peering through the veil? What is this? Right? Because everything still seems solid. Everything seems, it seems like wood. The beings gave me a kind of physics lesson. They said that we experience time at a different rate to them. And so when we see faces in, in anything, we're seeing a moment in time that is so much, because they live a very, very long time. We live very fast compared to them. And so our perception is, is dramatically different. For us, we're seeing a whole lifetime of just seeing a face in, in, a, in a bit of wood. But for them, it's like a fraction of a second. It's very, 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 it's even smaller than that even, if that makes sense. And so you can imagine all the changes in which a face would go through when it came to a face being shown on a piece of wood on the ceiling over a crazy period of time one matching their perception of time. It would go through a lot of change, a lot of movement. That's how they experience movement. You know, it's kind of like the documentaries. If you've ever smoked and gotten really high watching a documentary on plants and you see the time lapses when they're moving really fast to plants, that's their natural movement because they're experiencing time differently too. But we're seeing them at a much slower rate, you know? So they gave me this kind of analogy and they showed me everything by way of visuals, visions, but I'm still very much aware that I'm laying on the bed. That was up until the ceiling and the faces on it opened like a placenta. It, it just kind of burst open and a hand came down and I could see darkness. Literally, it was like the membrane of reality, the veil itself just burst open and it was just darkness. I'm seeing this with my eyes. It's like it's happening in reality. This black hand comes down, takes my hand and picks me up through the ceiling and I go off into space. And then I shrink into a flower, a black flower. And the being, it doesn't say this with words, but it feels like, it feels like I can just calm down now. And that was the gift that he was giving me because everything was so loud on LSD and he, he, he said it felt like he was saying that he needed to take me away from the earth entirely so that I wouldn't feel what was going on around me yeah. trip gets a little insane after that uh, it opens up I find myself in space and then the sun is stretched open and, and formed into a beam the earth wraps around it kind of like the hole in a donut, the sun beaming through it being the source of light for this donut shaped 
uh, earth. I say donut. It's more like a hot dog roll. There we go. It's like a tunnel. It has this tunneling effect where the earth is stretched around the beam of light, be that the sun. And I fly through it. And I see dinosaurs. I'm flying with pterodactyls. I'm looking at the ecosystem of the Jurassic period. And all in all, I'm just having a lot of fun. <laughs> but that was an instance on acid when I saw the faces and everything really come to life to an extent that just surpassed what I usually see whilst off of the uh, psychoactive. Now it's gotten to a place, rather now I've gotten to a point where I can look at things and deliberately see the faces in things and, and get to a point where they start moving a little bit and they can start speaking to things inside of wood grain as well as other surfaces that show patterns but uh yeah it was that was one of my most vivid experiences simply because of the whole going through the ceiling and i don't think i'll ever forget it it was pretty fun nice i that's i love it that was a really great story thank you so much i I had I was writing down so many questions as he was going through that. Uh, okay, so I am balding. I know that's random. <laughs> I know that's random. But I've had this. <laughs> yeah. So no hair here. But I've always had this really interesting idea that you know DNA is passed down from generation to generation, and somewhere down the line, I inherited this. Uh, I forgot what the 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 medical term for it is. Alopecia. Alopecia. Um, and I was like, you know, if I had the ability, like if I knew how to change this, I wonder if I could, like on the on the DNA sequence level, like would I have that ability? Like, I don't know. I just yes. want. I really wanted to ask you that question because I was like, there has to be something within the DNA that I can be like, up. Oh, Here's where it went wrong. Let me change that. And now future generations can thank me later. <laughs> yeah. you know, a few ways of doing it. I would love to hear it. <laughs> okay, fast thing. Okay. Reset the body. Hopefully you'll go deep enough to reset your genetics. Mm. Carnivore diet might do it. It's mm. an elimination diet where you have almost nothing in your system but sea salt and meat you know, and water. So that's a, that's a way that you can give your body a break and that might do it. Although of course, water fasting would be optimal because you're really putting nothing in there when it comes to an elimination diet or even dry fasting. But these are just ideas. Um, astral projection, you can impact your physical body by way of your ketheric body, which is a, another energy body that you have that directly connects to the genetic template of your body. You can change that in the astral realm. You can also change it by way of meditation if you can't astral project, simply by imagining yourself being healthy and well. Another thing you can do, separate from astral projection, is you can use your memory to actually upregulate genes. This is something you, let, you, you can do, it's proven. By remembering times when you had more hair, your body can't tell the difference between your imagination and this present reality. And so it starts to upregulate genes. If you do this for a long enough period of time, you'll start to see your hair come back through. Uh, I had a hair on my face here, and I took a photo of it on my phone because it's pretty cool. It was gray. Half of it is gray. These hairs are like, you know, four or five inches long. Half of it was gray. The other half, closer to the face, is now black because it turned back to black. You can, it's just gene expression, genes being turned on because they were turned off at one point. Now, it's important to mention that you have to be very calm and relaxed when you do stuff like this. You can't have a stressed out lifestyle because that down regulates genes and it could very well turn off the genes that are responsible for your hair growth. There are other things you can do, more physical things that you can do to get your hair back, like minoxidil, Rogaine, and so forth. But for the most part, you lose most of what you gain once you stop using it, which is annoying because I did it for a year and four months. 
and I ended up losing hair after gaining it. I gained a lot of hair, too much actually. My beard became way too thick and new hairs pushed out already pre-existing hairs on my head, which was a problem. I went through what they called the dreaded shed. Yeah. And then after a while, all my hair that I gained that stayed behind, you know, that didn't fall out during that shed, fell out anyway about three months after I stopped using it. And so there's the placebo effect, there's astral projection, there's fasting as a way of trying to shift the body, kind of reset the body back to normal. There are elimination diets. Those things can get you close. Mm. There's also massage. This is something that's proven to work to make sure that you're having, you're having a good amount of uh, blood flow to the surface of your scalp or anywhere where you need to grow hair. You know, obviously don't put anything on your head that's going to strip away the oils or damage your hair that that's loaded with sulfates. So the healthy stuff is good for your scalp. And don't wash your hair that often. A lot of people overwash their scalp and that strips oils and causes dandruff and a drying effect to the scalp. If you have, if you have dandruff, you can use uh, dandruff shampoos and they will actually get rid of it completely. Dandruff for the most part is a fungus, you know, uh, not just a damaged region of the scalp that has a hard time healing, you know, the sebum that protects the scalp from drying out. And so you get crusty, dry flakiness on the scalp. It's not just the compromised sebum on your head that's causing the the issue it's what's eating up all that oil that's causing the issue and most of the time not every time but most of the time it's fungus related and so anti-dandruff shampoos will kill the fungus try it out anyway just in case you do have it you know but in your case the alopecia i would go for the genes i would use meditations which change the genes at one point i changed the color of my eyes slightly when i was in college by imagining them being green, actually blue, they turned green. I imagine them being blue and I imagine getting into my genes and changing the gene expression from the ground up. After a while, my eyes started turning green because of course the melanin in my eyes or rather the melanocytes, the cells that produce melanin became downregulated the gene expression turned off. So those little factories stopped producing melanin. Over time, my eyes turned green because as you start to reduce the brown pigment in the eye, you get further back towards the shade of blue, passing through hazel and, uh, and green until eventually you get those baby blue eyes. So your mind has a lot to do with it. How you see yourself keeps your catharic template intact. So make sure you remember how young you are and how healthy you are throughout the rest of your life and never believe that you're getting anything other than that. Don't let roles force you into a sense of self that's quite um, problematic, you know, where you feel like you're old or you think you're old or you think you should be aging because that's going to affect how your cathartic body holds that template intact. And the cathartic, the cathartic template, the cathartic body, the template that it houses is being read by your genes, your genome. Okay. So you hold yourself in thought, you'll stay intact. <laughs> gotcha. Thank you for that. That was definitely uh, uh, fascinating. I, I definitely had this uh, ca crazy theory while I was on mushrooms. I was like, I wonder if I... <laughs> I wonder if I figured out a way to make mushrooms into a liquid extract and then apply it to my scalp would that help any things and there but then I had a I had this terrible fear that I would start growing mushrooms on my head. I was like, no. But yeah, I was like, because mushrooms connect, they, they connect everything. I'm I'm actually pretty far along on the alopecia. Um and I wish I would have done something many years ago to help out. But anyways, I think thank you for thank you for that. Um so um, uh, have you ever heard of Andrew Gilmore? 
Um, so Andrew Gilmore is, I don't, I don't want to say scientist, because I don't know if he's a scientist, but um, he lives in Japan and uh, uh, he done, he's done a few interviews where they talk about they're mapping out the DMT world with people and they're drip feeding people DMT through their veins or something like that. And like they're prolonging the DMT experience. And the fascinating part is that they are going into these locations consistently, almost like, you know, you're driving to a park or something like that. Like these, the, they're going to these locations, they're seeing the same beings, multiple people are seeing the same beings and they're kind of like mapping out the DMT world. Um, and I found that very fascinating. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I guess it wasn't really a question because <laughs> I just want to like bring it to your attention if you weren't, if you wasn't familiar with it. But um, uh, how does that sound to you? Is the, does that sound like something cool or I don't know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, very cool, very cool. I'm a, I'm a big fan of figuring things out, and I haven't heard of that particular person doing it. But I, I, I've I've heard of that experiment. Caught it down the grapevine and um yeah i wonder what they'll find probably the upside down <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah yeah fascinating maybe a portal opens up on the wall that they keep experimenting in and then they actually come through or something the fascinating thing to me was that they were seeing a lot of like egyptian stuff in this in this dimension in this realm they were seeing a lot of egyptian hieroglyph glyphics they were seeing like egyptian type of being entities that were wearing headdresses and stuff like that and i was really fascinated i'm like wow i wonder why that is in the dmt realm like what what's yeah. creating like why are these yeah. beings i mean i would assume that these beings influence those time periods and not they're influenced by the you know the egyptian time period um the egyptians had a fascinating connection with the spiritual world with they were very interconnected with it some say that some of the first records of witchcraft came from the egyptians you know they were very much in tune with entities and they understood magic very well and it wouldn't surprise me if a lot of that either came from the astral plane you know how they look and how they dress and their customs or maybe vice versa even maybe some of them stayed over there yeah, yeah. I think I'm gonna have to go now. Okay. Coming upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for this um, interview, Ryan. I uh, hope a lot of people get a lot of value out of this. Thank you for your time. Appreciate you so much. And um, I'll put your uh, information in the description if you want to check you out, learn about astral projection and all the things that you offer. And um, yeah, thank you so much for watching, guys, or listening. Peace out. No problem.